Welcome to the 100th Monkey Radio with Tom and Ramon, and today we are going to continue in a series of talks we're having with uh, Mr. Spencer Barclay, and uh, we've been going into trying to, uh, trying to understand a little bit more about uh, the financial system on this planet, the way currency travels back and forth, and uh, some of the uh, ins and outs in this system that we have right now, and I uh, think so we've been really we've been working hard on trying to actually just understand the lay of the land, and in doing so, Spencer's been a tremendous help for uh, I know me and I know Ramon both have uh, learned a few things just in the the little bit that we've scratched the surface on here with him. So yeah, okay. and none of this and and none of this you're going to learn in economic class. I just right. before you introduce him, I I wanted to. Tell people um, you can go to the website if you're listening on YouTube, um, the www.thehundredthmonkeyradio.com, and when you go up to the menu bar, you'll see it says um, Spencer up there. Um, what do I call it? Uh, money. Um, Nature of money with Spencer. So you click on that, and you can. Each segment that we did, so if this is the first time, you can go back and listen to this. Um, the overview we did, segment one and segment two. Plus, and there's also- a there's a ton of documentation that we were adding. Each segment, we end up adding more, and uh, uh, there's a ton of stuff that you guys can go through. And it's it's a lot of the places where Spencer's been pulling his information and the uh, documents and uh, references that he makes and how he comes to them is all there. So. So, uh, like, uh, someone yeah, would like to say, he, w- this is all not coming out of someone's ass. So, uh, <laughs> you know. uh, so Spencer, w- welcome back to the Hundreds Monkey Radio, and uh, man, we're glad to have you back here again. Yeah, thanks, guys. So today, I think we were going to go into uh, trying to understand what exactly corporations are. And uh, the expanse of this system, uh, where, where cor- corporation, companies, trust, and persons are involved. So let's start it. Start us off, Spence. What is a corporation? Well, a corporation is just a. Uh, it's a legal entity. It's it's a thing that exists, kind of like kind of like an X in algebra. We, it's just sort of a place saver, but it doesn't it doesn't actually exist. Here's why I'm bringing it up. More importantly, is a lot of the a lot of people that research it look into it for status purposes, and the created cannot be greater than the creator. And, and so there's some things to talk about in terms of status there later, but that's not why I'm bringing it up. I'm bringing it up for uh, because something that doesn't exist cannot create something that does. You know, uh, an idea cannot create, like, a hammer, right? It can't create a gold bar. It can't create labor. It can't create something that's real. Right. And so in understanding money, sometimes uh, there's there's a there's a fallacy or a uh, urban legend's not the right term, but there's a, a, a false a concept. Misconception. Yeah, yep, that the government creates money. And, and it can't. And so we have to understand the nature and character of fictions and, and how they operate and why they operate and, and to see what they really are. And, and then once someone has their mind around that, then it's not just believing someone say, well, the government can't create money. If, if you don't know the nature of a fiction, uh, a fictional entity, then, then it's a, then it's a leap of faith and, and it's just, founded in belief and at belief being not knowledge right okay r- real quick I want uh, something that's that just popped into my head while you're saying that uh, creator versus created now is there some uh, uh, law precedence that this is based on or is it just uh, based on natural law or what's what's that yeah it would just be reason or maxims of law and I'd have to dig for the exact one. You know, maybe we can pop that into the uh, the text later, as far as which which exact okay. it is. Okay, but there, this is this is a, something that is referenced 
and uh, in some form or fashion is uh, written down? Well, probably not. But just as an example, the created isn't greater than the creator. I mean, if you have uh, a 10-year-old child, he doesn't wake up in the morning and start snapping his fingers and calling the shots for the parents. You see, there's just one example of, of, of the created it isn't greater than the creator. And at some point, that playing field will level out. But that, it's just... Uh, it's just founded in reason, and 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 all those all those fundamental elements of reason are listed in maxims of law. Okay. So let, let me go find that separately. You kind of catch me flat-footed there, as far as. Okay. Well, 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 we can dig that that up, and uh, you know, I don't know if you uh, happen to poke through it during our conversation. That that'd be great. Maybe you can talk on it later, okay. or or we can just add something to the uh, to the show page here, uh, where it's referenced, so okay. people can take a look. Yeah. So back to corporations. Yeah. So they're just a, a fictional entity that that have rights and duties ascribed to them. And so let me just kind of lay out. There, there's the, of the four main types of fictional entities are are corporations, companies, trusts, and persons. And a person can be something like a sole corporation. And, and I'll give you a quick example. That would be something like a mayor or a bishop, an ecclesiastical office like a bishop, where it, it that concept exists in, in perpetuity. It just it, it would just live forever. Right. And, and various men would cycle through it and have that position of mayor or have the position of uh, bishop or cardinal or something like that. Right, right. And, and that is really quickly chases back to the roots of corporations, which were it, – it's kind of arguable, but there, there's definitely a common thread of, of opinion with researchers that research a, a common word in, in the Middle Ages for, for research that was done well before them is antiquity. And so there's a, a guy named Coke and Blackstone, and, and these guys were – were legal scholars, you know, several hundred years ago. And and they're noted for chasing back corporations to cities. And if you look up uh, the defi- a good definition of, of city now, you'll see that it's just a corporation. And, and that corporation of a city might have uh, a, a specific geographical jurisdiction. Right. But then everybody inside of that is not necessarily a member or a citizen of that city. And so, uh, real quick, we'd probably get into uh, the distinction between societies and communities. Because you might, within a very small geographical community like a small town, where a community is a blend of all of the societies, and in, in that society, those societies, you might have something as uh, maybe controversial as, as, as the Freemasons. Uh, or the or the Elks or the, a society is is a group of people that that are band together with mutual consent for a, right. for a common purpose, and and they and they can be as let's say as large as the United States as as a society to be a United States citizen, right? Part of that society as well, but it'll have many communities inside of it, right? But uh, a corporation is. Uh, Kind of started with cities and, and, and people banding together, uh, and, and thinking of the group as, as a separate entity. So if you had 10 people in a community and, and, and the, the city would be thought of as, as an 11th entity, 11, an 11th person. Hmm. Again, clearly it wouldn't exist. You know, if there were only 10 people in the world and, or maybe 20, you know, you got two separate, two separate societies. Right. Yeah. You, there, there would be, 22 entities 10 and 10 and uh, of individuals and then the society would be a, a third or, or a, a secondary uh, concept so when was the legalization of of the official corporations do you do you know when that happened like like in, in, in the number of hundreds or thousands of years ago Oh, <laughs> that what you're asking me, or just recently, like on the in the United States history. So Western society, yeah, corporations. I knew, I, I know, uh, they had to have some legal structure set up to call themselves a corporation. Or is this just 
something that has always been type thing, uh, the formation of, of the sort of corporation that we have right now, you know, yeah. like. Well, corporate, well, first of all, it's got to be made public. So, so the first element of due process is always notice. And, and you could boil down due process to purely notice, but let's not get into due process right now. Right, but, right. So to give you an example, we might be rushing ahead too far. We could bounce back and forth, but the United States of America, small u, as it was first established as a republic, was not a corporation. It was a trust. So, so let's bounce over to that real quick. And, and so, do you know, you know, the preamble of the Constitution where it starts out, we the people? You're right. We the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union and all that? Right. How about I just go over the whole thing? So, yeah. we the, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States. That was made available publicly. Right. And it was just, well, you know how, uh, we, now here's how we do make things publicly, public notice is to file things in the county recorder. You, you know how it used to be done is you used to, if you had something to say, you'd go tack it up on, on the most public place you could in town. Right. And a lot of times that would, you'd go nail something to the wall of the local church. And, uh, that's what Martin Luther did when he started to rebut some of the things that those guys were doing was he just went, Hey guys, that, that's what you're saying. Well, he didn't have a podium or a, or a public, uh, venue to speak per se. So he just went and nailed his stuff to the, to the church door. And that wasn't anything that was generally accepted on the community. It was just pure raw principle. You have to make your, stuff known publicly if you want it if you want it to be a public issue and so he went and nailed it to the door and so a trust is is a grantor and it's a beneficiary and you have to have a trustee you have to have an asset you have to have intent uh and it, and it has to have a purpose and so that preamble has all of those if it you know if you think in terms of pure raw principle that was the declaration of the trust. And then within it, with, within that, now that preamble, that's the door into that venue or that jurisdiction. And so attorneys argue that the preamble is, it, it doesn't mean anything. All of the meaning is inside of the Constitution. Hmm. And, and that's true if you're already in the Constitution, if you're already under uh, or below that jurisdiction. That's true. Uh, but when we see that the created can't be greater than the creator, at some point someone had to create the Constitution and had, it, that form of government had to be created. And I think that's a threshold that a lot of people have a real tough time getting their mind through and, and getting it through that threshold accurately. Because uh, uh, once you see that it, it was it was just simply... A uh, plural of man is people. It's not. It's not persons. Uh, that's skipping way ahead. I'm just, let's just establish that for now. And so, uh, if we go back to that uh, that preamble, the, the grantor is we the people. Right. And the purpose is is all within to, that, huh? To order the to form a more perfect union. Blah blah blah. Right. Which justice? Yeah, that's the purpose. And the trustees is to ourselves. And the beneficiary is to our posterity. And intent is we do ordain and establish. Like that's here it is. I hereby declare. Right. And then the asset can go both ways. It can be back up in the purpose in order to form a more perfect union. So, so the more perfect union would be the asset, and so would so would uh, justice and domestic tranquility. Those are all those are all assets within it. That's that's what it is you're getting out of it. That's the thing. And then the venue would be the, the Constitution itself. Hmm. I might be a little wrong on that. I, I don't really know how venue fits into it. But anyway, all the elements of a trust are there. And, and then uh, I don't think anybody would argue that it's been made publicly available. <laughs> right? right, right. 
It's not yeah. tacked up on on any churches that I know of, but it's it's certainly a, um, publicly declared. And that wasn't registered in in, in county recorders, or it, it's not it's not necessarily lodged or uh, fixed within a current system. They just said, "Hey, this is what we're doing." Uh, in a in a public area, right? Yeah. So, or, or, so yeah, just made it. Public. But it was made it made known to the public. Yep. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm just wondering um, how strong that holds to today's standards. So if I was to do that and let's say I put it on Facebook or yeah. went and tacked it up, at, you know, on, on a public area, the old, the old style, would that would I be able to argue that that I made it public? Well, now that you're doing that kind of stuff, it's all, now you're just open to. You know, if I were to just take the flip side of that just to see, okay, well, is there a way I could shoot it down? The first thing that pops into my mind is is you, you want to use the venue that's most public. So um, I can't imagine anybody would say Facebook is the most public way to go. Right. Most people, for, most people use uh, the newspaper now, right? Well, that's uh, one. There's tons of legal notices in the newspaper. There is, and here's where that came out of is, is as the U.S. expanded west, the, the uh, newspapers were, were were very sought out because there was there was no other information available, and and, and the communities were so dynamic that that a newspaper was the only, that was the only way to really communicate to somebody. Right. Uh, and and so that at one point was the most prominent way to go, and, and though even though things have uh, evolved now, and I don't know that most people read newspapers, but it's still a very accepted way to make something publicly available, especially since you can look up contents of a newspaper on the internet. Right. Uh, yeah. I think the cornerstone of public, uh, what's publicly available is, is typically at least the county recorder. Uh, uh, I'm just wondering, because for example, like we have the 100th Monkey, and we have a like page, which in order to look at that page, you don't have to be on Facebook. You can just log on to it, and because there's so many people onto it, so I'm just wondering if that would fall into it or sure. It it might. I mean, but you'd be exposing yourself to it because it's not. That's not generally accepted across the community. That if we want to look for official public notice, we look on Facebook. That's not something right. that's, I would say generally. Uh, known it might okay. assist i mean if you were to say hey look at i i attempted to make something publicly known you're well, also what about the guy that got arrested for saying something about what do you say ramon firearms and had firearms in the government in the same paragraph or something yeah the ex-military guy i, yeah. I mean that's probably going a little Far um, that that away was already from the topic. far out. <laughs> yeah, but I, I I see your point because there's been like guys who got in trouble in the military for saying certain things on Facebook. Yeah. So would that be? That's why I'm wondering if it's being considered public or not. Uh, I don't know. But once you're in the military, uh, you you've assigned all your rights away and, and traded them for privileges, and you uh. There's a, there's a master servant relationship going on there. Uh, a guardian ward relationship is probably a better way to put it. And, okay. and you all fall under the uniform code of military justice. You, you bet, and you're going to go by exactly what they say goes. And, and so if you're if you're a if you're a private in boot camp and the sergeant wants to come and check your Foot Locker, you don't ask him for a search warrant, right? I mean, you, say, you don't start barking out constitutional rights it's ridiculous <laughs> and so that's something else that that concept rolls right back over to a united states citizen and when people think or believe or want to be a united states citizen and don't really understand the nature and character of it that's that's the equivalent of being a private in the army you've signed up for it you've traded all your rights away because the united states is a corporation and so it's now a democracy it's now de facto in other words, it's not de jure and it's not a republic, and it's very limited in scope. And so, w when people want to be a, a member of that, it's not just sort of it, it's not the community; it's the society. Hmm. That's why 
the the equivalent of asking a, a a private asking a sergeant for a search warrant is the equivalent of someone getting a ticket for um, not wearing their seatbelt while they're in their car, and then and then saying they have rights. Right. It doesn't make any sense at all. And so one of the things when people don't understand their status and don't understand how those types of things get imposed on them, the instant they go off in the wrong direction in front of a judge, that's what they get. They've demonstrated. It's not that anybody does anything to them. They did it to themselves. They demonstrated that they were not mentally competent. And there's no difference between someone who's, who's it's called non compos mentis. There's no difference between someone saying foolish things in court and them being truly mentally handicapped. And so there's a concept of, we're getting a little off track here, but there's a concept called uh, parents patre. And, and it's it's the parent power of the state to take care of those who are mentally deficient. And it's and it's rooted in equity, not law. And so that is, hey, we got we got to do what's fair here. We can't just say, hey, everybody out there is is to each their own and whatever they can whatever they can do for themselves. When, when someone's mentally handicapped, that there's a state that has a duty to step in and take care of them. And so when someone starts to argue rights in, in a traffic court. They're instantly, they've proven themselves to be uh, mentally incompetent. And, and one, the judge can't tell you because who's more mentally incompetent? Uh, someone who's truly mentally handicapped or someone who, who knows that and then tries to engage in a conversation that involves reasoning and, and rationalization. Hmm. So now the judge can't say anything. And, and he, he as a, as an agent of the state, has a duty to take care of uh, whoever it is that's in front of him, or whoever it is that's demonstrated themselves to be, uh, one, su- subject to the jurisdiction, and, and he knows that because those people walked in, they walked into court, they, they presented themselves to him. So that means they agreed to his jurisdiction, and then now they've presented them, they've proven themselves to be mentally incompetent. And, and so now he's got to take care of it, and, and his judgment is still off the table. It's, it's not his choice. He's just got to go by the statutory regulations laid down by his employers, the the, the legislature. Mm. Yeah. Um. I I just want to interrupt you for a minute. Yeah. Um. To let everybody know because I know this is gonna stir up a lot of questions to people, and some people are going like, "What the?" Um. You can send your questions in to um to us at um info at uh, the hundredth monkey radio.com and we will have a segment of just question and answers so whatever questions you have just write them down send them in and then we'll ask during the question and answer oh yeah um, segment that we'll do so that's coming up fe- yeah. yeah don't feel like uh, um, you know you're completely lost if you don't understand certain concepts plus we also uh, on the on the website we also have uh, under the uh, the link for these this series of shows, there is a comment section there. So if you want to jump in there, you can always do that. Yeah. So please continue, Spencer. Go ahead. So uh, I guess we had like a little snafu or something weird. But um, what we were talking about was... When people go into court and they show themselves to be uh, mentally handicapped, um, yeah. please continue, Spencer. Well, it's more like non compost mentis, not mentally competent. And, and there's there's four different four different degrees of that. Some of it's just uh, a biologically affected, where where they're where they're truly mentally handicapped to some degree, always, and. and uh, the last kind can be someone who's just temporarily nonsense. And so that could be, you know, someone who's completely irrational in court. Uh, a judge has a duty based on parents' patre to, uh, take over and, and, and to be, be, uh, a, a guardian in a guardian word relationship. And, and so then they just, they just take you down whatever path is, is set up by the statutory regulations. And so that's why uh, so sometimes when people start arguing nonsense, that's one of the ways where uh, a, it, it gives uh, a judge 
the actual obligation to say, hey, hold it. Another word out of you and I'll hold you in contempt of court. Uh, because one of two things is they've either dishonored the judge. Let's not get into that. They just haven't been point by point and relevant or unambiguous. But they could have just been their, their rationale or reasoning could be nonsense. And if it is, that's that's what allows a judge to shut somebody up and say one more word. And I'll hold what would we consider, in that sense, what would we consider nonsense? Like if I said, um, I, I, I had my seatbelt on and the cop just didn't see that or something like, you know. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so now, now here's what you did is you just skipped over the, the major unspoken premise and you agreed with the judge that you had a duty to wear that seatbelt you just, and, and not only that you did have it on and now it's just a, an error in the in what the policeman is reporting and yeah. that that's different now you're not arguing rights what my point is sometimes people go in and argue rights and say hey i i have you know there's freedom i don't i didn't hurt anybody you know there's no injured party when i when i wasn't wearing a seatbelt uh, there's no injured party Okay, and and that's like telling a, a a drill sergeant in the army when you're when you're in boot camp that um, he needs a search warrant to, to check your locker. It, that's ridiculous. It's nonsense, right? I mean, if that truly happened and somebody was in the army and 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 they were just they genuinely told uh, this sergeant that he needs a warrant <laughs> and this. And the, and this, and the situation escalated to the sergeant's commanding officer. Um, clearly that th there's a couple of people that just can't have an intelligent conversation with, uh, private because that, that, that's so far beyond the scope of that conversation. They've moved so far beyond that. They do have, uh, jurisdiction just to check his footlocker and they don't have a duty to explain it to him. So, uh, um, yeah, they, they've moved way too far beyond that. And so that's kind of like going into court and saying you have rights. If you had so, rights, you wouldn't be in court. So I'm wondering if this would move into, um, let's say, a company, a, a corporate. Uh, let's just, um, just make up any of those big name companies, uh, corporations. Boeing, maybe? Yeah. And let's let's say like uh, the manager went into my desk and searched. Would that be the same idea as well? Maybe I don't know. Now now it's we, we're tangling directly into issues of private property, and I, and I would say probably I don't know. That, that we would it's all that would all be depending on the the local corporation's uh, statutes and regulations, right? Yeah, their bylaws and the agreements that you've already had with them and within and, that corporation. Yep. Yeah, because you usually sign like a type of contract. Because well, but, in the military, in the military, you're basically you you'd sign all your rights away. Yeah. Right off the bat, you sign on the dotted line to join. Your rights are gone. You yeah. now belong to the United States government. Yeah. So that would probably be in the employee's handbook, uh, or or the uh, the, the employee uh, employment agreement, and and a lot of that might go back to the some of that might go back to the charter of the corporation. Com company policies. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Which just goes back to contract. Uh, but uh, anyway, within corporations, the, I kind of got. I, I I probably shouldn't have spent so much time on uh, on that parents patre thing, but. Uh, <laughs> no worries. We understand it a little bit better now. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I, I didn't know some of those things, so. Uh, and there's a difference between a corporation and a company. Now, and, and now here's something else too: is I'm I'm speaking from a point of view of before. I'm not looking at this through the statutory eyes, through what a current conventional attorney hyphen at hyphen law, which is all one word, and it's different than an attorney at law for three different words. How they see it, because they're going to refer to whatever the statutory regulations are within their system. And, and so, if you try to define what companies and corporations and trusts are, it will all be redefined and we're not using words through that, we're using terms and there's a difference between a word and a term outside of the statutory system, companies are different than corporations 
and a, and a company is very, very, very akin to a partnership where you have just individual men with that, that act uh, together for a common commercial or business purpose. And, and one of the qualifications is each is agent for the other. And there's no corporate shield. When, when you su- if you were to sue that company, you would be suing all of the individuals, joint and several. And so uh, th- there's there's elements of uh, liability that aren't shielded with a company that is shielded with a corporation. Okay. Uh, and so, and then there's there's trust. Trusts are also a separate legal entity. And a trust is a, is a grantor, a beneficiary, a trustee over an asset. And, and yeah, to, to uh, create one, we have to have in, in the declaration, we have to have intent, purpose, and all that kind of stuff. But that's not what it is. Uh, a trust has all those, those first elements in it. All right. Oh, real, real quick, I hate to interrupt you during this, but uh, b- back to, to companies for a second. Yeah. Uh, now, a company, uh, basically the way I saw it was that a company was, was either earned, uh, owned by a sole person or maybe a partnership type thing. And uh, I was wondering, is there a limit to the number of people that can be in a, par- a partnership? Yeah, 50. 50. So, oh, so once there's 50, if it goes over 50, it has to turn to a corporation. Well, I don't know. That's the limit. And... Another element of company is, is the shares are never uh, available publicly. It's, it's just an, another little distinction. And here's something else too is, uh, w- when you, I have these, these big long, like thousand page books on, on corp- the nature of corporations. And one of the things they all say is that the, to define a corporation is, is just hugely difficult. And, and they just need to have all of their elements defined in there somehow. And so, uh, one, one standards definition of a corporation can be completely different than another. And, and same thing with points in time. Every 50 years you go back in time, mm-hmm. the word corporation is going to have substantially uh, a different definition because of the regulation surrounding it. It's part of what gets incorporated into that definition. Yeah, but companies, Historically, at the common law level, Tom is is what what you're asking there is what, you know is there th- those are the limitations that's been generally agreed upon over time is, is 50, and then those shares cannot be made available publicly. In other words, if one of the 50 wants to sell out, everybody else has to agree to who now buys the share. That's that's a difference between. Uh, a, a publicly available uh, traded company and one that's not is that l- let's just say there is a company of only four people and one of the guys says, "Hey, look at I want to retire, or I move I'm going to move far away, or I just don't want to deal with this anymore, or I want the money." Whatever the reason is, he he could do one of two things: he could either sell his share to uh, a, a new fourth individual, or he can sell his share back to the the three existing, and the company shrinks from four to three. But the bottom line is there has to be agreement between all four of them at all times as so, to what's going on. What, so what what makes a, a company? So, for example, uh, let's use this radio show. Yeah. Um, would this be considered a trustee, a company? Obviously, it's not a corporation. Well, is it is it registered? No. Uh, maybe. So one of the one of the things that you would look for is is there a business license and wh- how does the charter read? The charter will tell you the purpose and how it's set up. And so maybe we ought to take the, the the radio show off the table as far as something specific and just say that's what you're looking for right there is is the charter, it, whether or not it's registered. Okay, registered with uh, a, a political entity. Okay, so it's like FCC or something well, like no. that within. With looking at the the radio thing, no, not FCC something made public. No, FCC is regulatory. Okay. I'm 
we're, we're looking for business license kind of thing. And that's always done with the secretary. Okay. So any registration of a, if you register a business license, that makes it uh, qualifies for what you're talking about here. Yeah. That, uh, well, that tells us what to scrutinize, and, and that's always that kind of stuff. Will you can't register a company? You got to. You know what? That's partnership. Now I don't know. I don't know about partnerships, and I know uh, LLPs, limited liability partnerships, okay. uh, a, lot, a lot of times are uh, in the legal world, but I still think that they are uh, corporations. Hmm. But they might have uh, elements of, of company where some of that criteria of all all the partners have to agree as to who comes and goes. That definitely sounds like a. Uh, a law firm. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know how statutory and, and company all folds into it. Okay. That's way too technical for and beyond anything I've cared to look into. Okay. What uh, the reason I want to the reason I wanted to look into this kind of stuff is not to, to really get down into the to the depths of this kind of stuff. It, it's just to see that it's something that doesn't exist. First of all, and 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 the created can't be greater than the creator. So here's how, if, if we want to think of something that doesn't exist, if if, if Tom and I both owned a, a coffee stand, an espresso stand, and uh, we were 50-50 partners on it, and we both worked the same hours, we worked open to close, and the two of us showed up for work one day, and the place had completely burned to the ground. And, and let's just say it was called uh, City Espresso. If, if the next week we got a, an insurance check for the, for the fire damage and we opened up business at the same intersection just across the street and we just continued to call it City Espresso, it would have the, – none of the, the assets would be the same. It would be physically completely different. And the only thing now that's the same would be that the two of us are still, are, are still participating 50-50. And then let's say at the end of that year – if, if over time, uh, both Tom and I each individually and with agreement, you know, no controversy, but we just, we each sold out our 50% partnership to another two owners. It, it would still be conceivably called City Coffee. And now there's nothing physically is the same. And maybe the hours changed. It's at a different location and there's different people and yet it's still called City Coffee. See, that's once you once you start to eliminate every little thing about a, a company to see, okay, well, what's the same about it? It's the only thing it's the same is is the idea, the name, and the charter, the paperwork registered with the state. Hmm. And, and so I'm kind of going through that little exercise to show that uh, a corporation does not exist. I mean, you can't bring me five feet of Coca-Cola, or you can't go bring three pounds of Nike over to to analyze or to you know you can't go three quarts of of uh, IBM it it just it physically doesn't exist and so if, once you kind of go through that exercise in your mind you can see that well if a corporation doesn't exist and the United States is either a corporation or a trust depending on which one we're talking about whether we're talking about the republic or the democracy uh, the de facto or the de jure. You can, it, if, if it doesn't exist, how can something that doesn't exist create something? And it can't. It, it's it's the people working and functioning within the system that do all the creating. And that's that's one of the real big mysteries. That's or or the or, or the frauds in the system that people kind of don't see that. And and so if a, a fiction can't create something, it can't create money. That's just one of the things that I, I wanted to bring up to, to eliminate from the, the, the conversational table, so to speak. Because if the, gov if, if the government can't create money, sometimes people say, well, you know, the government creates, creates this. Or even the Federal Reserve creates the money. Federal Reserve can't create anything. It's either, it's either a trust, a company, or a corporation. It can't create anything. So there's something else, too, that once people start to entertain that concept and really get it down in their mind, yet the, the federal government does owe, you know, who knows how many trillions, and let's not even get into it because it's just that that's a conversation that's 
Right, right. It, the, you still won't get to the bottom of an exact figure, but it's in at least in the trillions. Who do they owe that money to? The only the only debt ultimately is as you work your way back up through those planes of, of created creator, is that uh, all that money is owed to the people. And, and so one of the things that the news media does, and even the alternative news media does very well, is to spool people up with a lot of anxiety o- over that debt. And if the, and if they knew who that money was truly owed to. Man, you talk about a riot in the streets. That's owed to people. And so uh, currency uh, always returns to source. You ask anybody that, that studies or knows electricity is that you always, one of two things, you're either going to store currency in terms of electricity in, in a cell somewhere. You're going to either store it somewhere or it'll get grounded. And, and you'll lose the whole charge back into ground. Hmm. Uh, and, and so another way to say that is cur- currency always returns to source. That's natural law. Well, that's the same. Th- it doesn't matter if we're talking electricity or money. And that's actually something that I started a very brief conversation on with uh, a guy named Jason Verbelli. And I want to finish that because I don't know the electrical side to that concept as much as I do the financial side. No, well, maybe, no, I'm sure there's some some distinct parallels there. Yeah, maybe we'll bring you guys both on because I, that would that would be an interesting uh, conversation because th- that's I, I don't think anybody's ever gone there. I said something about that directly to him when I met him this summer, and I said something about currency. I don't remember now exactly what I said, but I said, "Hey, currency always returns to source," and and I was specifically and deliberately referring to uh, money. The, the words I chose were deliberately so that he would see the parallel with uh, in electricity. And he was, it, it caught his attention. I don't mm. remember his exact reaction, but he, he paused for quite a while when I said that. A little uh, flabbergasted, maybe? Something, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know exactly what was going on in his mind, and, and we were kind of having a back and forth parallel on. It. We had so many topics going that, you know, I don't remember exactly how that conversation played out, but I remember saying that to him, and it definitely caught his attention. Yeah. So, um, I I, I want to move um, a little bit into persons, um, because I think that one would probably blow people's minds the most. Um. Yeah, so I think we understand corporations, uh, companies, and the trust thing as being a non-entity, but uh, a fictional entity. Yeah. Uh, but person, how, how does that break down? Well, that's a, that's a hybrid of, of two um, <laughs> Latin roots, P-E-R, meaning by, by way of, or through. And uh, son is short for uh, sonus. Uh, S O N A S uh, for sound, and it's and, and so it's it means by uh, or by way of or through sound, and it was a ri- a person was very uh, it was generally well known that that was the name that's that would be the the word we would use for character, in 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 Latin and and old Italian plays. Characters, we use the word character, they use the word person. Hmm, really? Yeah. So it's kind of, it's kind of, uh, obviously the use of it's morphed a little bit. A little bit. But there's, there's been some legitimate segues into it. And so the person, you would say the person of cardinal or the person of mayor. They're a person. Whoever is filling that role is a person and it's just absolutely literal and true. It's just that they're functioning as that character. And so mm-hmm. an, an, one, one of the other sort of euphemisms or, 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 or definitions that was meant in Latin was mask. Uh, I don't know where you're going to see that. Maybe in Webster's 1828. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I was always under the assumption that person was just a... Uh, uh, individual? Another, yeah, another word to, uh, you know, indicate a, a an individual. Yeah, no, and so that's why you'll never see it in statutory regulations. Whenever there is 
when the government is um, saying, hey, we are the authority and we're telling you what you can and can't do, they always use the word person. A person shall not do this or a person shall do that because that because a U.S. citizen is that character that they're talking about. You almost never see the word in, 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 that, that refers to people. And, and people is uh, derives from the concept of just the population. And when you think of population, that's real. Those are that's physical, tangible. That's not abstract character stuff. That's that's absolutely real. Right. And so uh, you know, here in the state of Washington, I'm I'm at Washington. I'm not in it. In it is sort of a a, a grammatical trick to say that you're in a, in a in a corporation. But if you're located somewhere physically, you say at. And so if you, if I'm at Washington, that means I'm I'm physically located with, at in that geographical area. And when you say you're in it, you're saying I'm a I'm a corporate fiction inside mm. inside of that corporation. That could be a nasty trick that somebody could play to get you to concede to jurisdiction, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I can see what so I can see the judge saying, uh, "Do you live in the state of Washington?" Right. Yeah, a real yep. easy one to to not be able to see. Right. Uh, and so very 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 rarely do statutory uh, language include the word people, but it does on occasion. And so I just dropped a link into in, into this uh, window here. I don't know if you guys see it. Yeah, I got yeah, it. Yeah, I see it. Okay. And so what I said was that w when the government is saying, "Hey, look, at we're, we are giving a command to that plane below us, the created, or the creator is giving a command to the uh, created," they use the word person. In this in this particular uh, statute right here, they're not giving a command. They're just recognizing something as truth, and they yeah, use the, we, they use the I word. Was, I was gonna say, should we um, read this really quickly so people know what we're talking about? We'll just read we'll the, a, read the first sentence. Okay, um, I'll read. Uh, the people of this state do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies that serve them. Yep. Yep. Mm. And that's that's another way to sort of triangulate and look at this thing of the created are not greater than the creator. Because here what they're saying is the agencies that serve them are, I mean, that could be the police departments, the, the public agencies. Right. The people do not yield their sovereignty. And sovereignty just means there's no higher authority. It doesn't mean that you have subjects underneath you. Right. It just means that you're not in a master-servant relationship. That's why the term uh, sovereign citizen doesn't make any sense at all. A, a sovereign... Right, right. Because if you're sovereign, then you're not going to be uh, subject to uh, uh, an entity that creates the situation of you being a citizen. Right, right. It's Yeah. Now, some people say, well, I'm, this, I'm a citizen of the republic, and uh, 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 I, I think it's just... Uh, I think that's nonsense. You well, can't. there's not really a republic here. Well, and citizen <laughs> is is rooted in, in civil anyway, and so now we're back to uh, a civil system. Right. So, I I want to go a little bit into the um, uh, what's that called? This um, correct me, Spencer here. Uh, straw man, lean straw man. What is it? Um. Well, I don't straw know. man lean. Straw man lean. No. Oh. no. Well, where are you going, Ramon? What's this uh, have to do with person? Uh, right. A lot. It's the 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 law called the oh, what is it? it's something like straw lean or straw man lean or lean straw man. Well, the concept of straw man is definitely uh, something that's been around for quite a while. And so a straw man is something that doesn't exist until some something else comes in to take the place of it. And so it's just sort of like a place saver. And a lot of times, if you know that, that someone lives in a particular house and, and they live three doors down from you, but you don't know their name, but you recognize the guy, you see him all the time, if he just walked up to your door one day for, for whatever reason, 
but unprovoked. And he and he kicks your door in, and he, and and he and he breaks into your house, and you can physically identify the guy, but you don't know his name, and you want to sue him. You can't just have no space in the forms or in the paperwork or in the lawsuit for where his name should go. And, and it quite often, the name John Doe would go in there, and there would be a further description that says, hey, look, it, I don't know the name of this guy, but I can physically describe him. Uh, I would recognize him again. I know where his, his residence is or his domicile, and, and I can prove that who this guy is. I just don't know his name. That John Doe name that you would fill in there would be the straw man. That's that, that that's a concept of straw man. And so uh, when you see what that is in terms of just raw principle, a lot of people uh, have seen uh, the similarity in the pattern with their name written in all capital letters. And I think that what I'm thinking of um, th that falls into it. But what I'm thinking of is. When, for example, when you're born, you get a birth certificate, yep. and that creates the person, not not the uh, individual. Right. Is that correct? So it's almost like a mini corporation. Yeah, more like a trust. Okay, like a trust. Yeah. I'm trying to see if I can find a definition of straw man. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of that. There's a law called straw man lean or uh, I can't remember. Well, know. yeah. So sometimes people will put a lean against that all capital letter name. And what that does is it um, anybody else that w would want to get in line or, or to or to have a claim against someone they, they, in, in the statutory world. Here's the theory. And I'm not going to speak to whether or not it's accurate, but it, it goes something like this. If you have a lien against your your all capital letter name, if somebody else comes and it's and it's a ridiculous sum, uh, ten billion dollars, twenty billion dollars, and, and someone else wants to come along and charge that name uh, with a claim against it, and let's say it's something like uh, a policeman gives you a, a speeding ticket or the IRS comes and charges you with tax liability, some of the theory went that they would just they would just go and plead guilty. Because they would get all the money because anytime uh, liens go first in time, first in line, or, or the other way around, first in line, first in time. And so if you have a, if someone has a lien on, on your property and, and someone else after that successfully sues for, for some other reason, the first guy with a lien gets, gets, he gets first, he gets the first round of money. Hmm. And so if his lien is less than the second guy, he gets he gets his portion and then whatever's left over goes to the guy that sued. And so that's the theory with put some of these guys, you know, you put a twenty billion dollar lien against your all capital letter name, and then now if you get a speeding ticket, you, they would just go in and say, hey, yeah, fine, but I but I also have a lien against that name, and so any money that that tr transitions due, due to this uh, due to this account or this transaction goes to me it's a, got it and a, okay and a, yeah called as cheat e s c h e a t okay hmm. so the reason why i brought that up because uh um i heard a story and somebody who listens to the show um that it was the first time i ever heard of this and the sovereignty and anything it's the first time i ever heard of it and he's telling me a story how his cousin was a professional um criminal uh -huh. and when what they did was he went and he sold his um the, the way it was explained to me so you can correct it he sold his his corporate name over to china yeah so he was no longer under the united states ju jurisdiction what so all his debt and all his criminal record is completely yep. wiped because it no longer belongs to the United States. Huh. So even though he still lives in the United States, he doesn't fall under any of their jurisdiction. Wow, that's a pretty exotic theory. 
and one I wouldn't ever want to get tangled up in. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that also included like bankruptcy or anything like that, and so many other people that become sovereign. That, that's one of the things that I hear is that they no longer uh, um, have to pay any taxes or have to because they no longer under that jurisdiction. Yeah. Man, what an awkward way to do it. I mean, that's now you're you're trying to be. You're, it, it seems to me like that's a method of adding difficulty to to, to confusion and difficulty. And some of the some of the, the cleanest paths that I've seen are if, if people are uh, adverse or opposed to, to taxes in some way, they found themselves a way to not be billed in the first place. In other words, that's the system agreeing with and says, "Hey, look at this." Uh, we don't have standing to, to bill you. Whether you're not getting the services or, you know, whatever, whatever it is, a lot greater elements of harmony to it. Yeah. Let yeah. me give, let me give you a, a quick another example. Another example where I heard it was, uh, so a lot of farmers were losing their land yeah. because they couldn't pay for it or Monsanto was coming in saying, oh, you're using my grains and stuff like that. So in order to get out of it, they would sell that um, their land over to China, so they were acting as the the uh, I can't think of the correct legal term, but they were the they were the one yeah taking care of that land, but that land no longer belonged to the United States, so Monsanto couldn't touch it because it's no longer under their jurisdiction. Or the government couldn't say you you can't afford the property tax, so we have to take the land. So this is the way they were saving their land by doing that. And I don't know if they always use China, but that's just one example. Yep. It sounds like out of the frying pan and into the fire to me. <laughs> <laughs> have you heard of this, Tom? Uh, you know, I heard something about it, but uh, about people doing that. But uh, huh? like Spencer said, it just seemed like there was there was a lot more. It just felt like there would there had to be a much simpler way to do the same thing. Okay. All right. So let's move on. Yeah. Okay. I don't know where we were with corporations, but uh, well, I, we I, were kind of talking about person and and uh, you know what, what's up, what's with all the the all cap thing real quick. Well, I know most everybody knows this, but let's go let's hit that real quick again. What that is called capitis? Uh, what's it called? Capitis. Yeah. Diminutia. Diminutia. Maxima. Right. By by capitalization, you've been diminished to the maximum. Your rights have been diminished to the maximum. And so, in in, in times of, of Roman law, if your if your name was written in all capital letters, it was it was a state a slave status. And so. Um, it was one of the ways where the system could have that plausible deniability where um, no one's ever doing any, anything to you shows that uh, you, yourself. Here's where we see all capital letters now in terms of it, it. The intent is that it means that it's a dead entity, and you'll see that capital letters have historically always been on tombstones, all caps. In other words, the, the name is – every single letter is all capital letters. And in like ships, a, sh a ship would be named all capital letters, and, and that's a, it would be considered a dead entity like a corporation. You know, and what's the first few letters, the first four letters of corporation is corp or corpse. Hmm. Coincidence. <laughs> yeah. So um, – I'm trying to remember. So – they would put that under the same as um, uh, when they put all capital. They, they would do that, like for example, when you go to prison, don't they do the same thing? No, I'll tell you. You ready? Yeah. So as here's something that one of the things that really had a eureka moment for me was that that it seemed to that Rome that Romans had an inordinate interest in conquering and spreading. The Roman Empire was just way too excited and way too motivated to be conquering. I mean, well, why, why does anybody want to go to war that bad? It just didn't make sense. When I started to look into this capitus diminutia maxima, 
which in, in, in Roman law books from the 1800s, I can give you a bunch where, where they just openly and explicitly discuss this stuff, status. One of the books people can go look up is called The Trichotomy of Roman Law. And, and that book is explicitly talks about this kind of stuff. I don't know if you can find one in paper. If you did, it'd probably be a thousand bucks or something. But there, you can find the PDF online. You know where to look. Or to get a hold of you guys, I can pass it along. Mm, okay. Yeah, we'll post this on the page. So once again, um, you don't think that, uh, we're pulling this out of our ass. Okay. So. It's gonna be the theme of the show. <laughs> So here's what's going. Here's what the, you know. We use the, the, this concept of Roman law, but that's how that's a term that we use now, looking back at the situation then. So when you look back at what was going on in the Roman with, with some of these laws that didn't apply to their citizens, when when they would go conquer another nation, it was as if upper management just defeated upper management of, of another organization. But the Romans did not have jurisdiction over the people that they conquered. They knew that. I mean, because law is is either you either cause damage or injury and you owe something, or you need to be held to your promises or agreements. And that's the real secret in all the system is you just don't understand the kind of uh, promises that you've committed to. And one of and, and one of the ways that we we promise constantly now that erodes our rights and gets us into that private in the army status is when you fill out uh, applications. And so when you submit applications for registration or submit applications, those are little agreements and you don't know the the words and terms. And and you did it to yourself. You confessed on yourself. I'll give you an example. Uh, If you look up the word male or female in a a good law dictionary, something that's old, not not quite as sanitized as newer Black's Law, you'll see that uh, male and female specifically refers to either animals or slaves. And look at every single form that you fill out, or, or sorry, application that you fill out for the government. They always want to know if you're male or female. Right. So what they're asking is, they're, they're, the, the, the major unspoken presumption is, we know you're a slave. What's your what's your gender? No one ever says I'm neither male or male or female. It's man or woman. No one ever corrects it. Well, that I know of. I mean, it, but that's just one of the. That's my point with they 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 provide documentation for you to confess on yourself as a, as a slave status and hmm. so that was the trick back in the in the roman times is when they'd go conquer another country they would you know they'd find out who all the people were with a with a census and then provide their names in all capital letters and they'd say is this you and they'd say yeah that's me well they confessed on themselves they didn't know that the intent on the other side was that of what what they meant by the all capital letter name, and so that is the filling out those forms, or, or to to get people to, uh, to to commit through oaths or whatever those secret tricks were to get people to uh, subject themselves to a lower status. Right. That, so this this has been used uh, quite a bit, hasn't it, in court as far as arguing sovereignty. Are yeah. Arguing, argue, arguing, uh, not sovereignty, but uh, jurisdiction. Jurisdiction, yeah. And so that's the trick, and that was the motivation for the for the Roman Empire to expand like it did, is because they would just they get people to just fall right in line, and the judges know full well, hey, look at if if you've agreed to do something, you damn well better do it. That's why contracts are so powerful, and that's why contra- you don't, a lot of times contracts are completely unknown. You know, adhesion contracts. He just never knew, and so that's why those are so important. But uh, so, the, so the whole thing about you know arguing, uh, I guess it's arguing ignorance in a courtroom. Yeah. Uh, so going in and saying, okay, you know, that's not me. I wasn't aware of uh, you know the type of argument. I I wasn't aware of what that meant. Yeah. How do you how does that get argued in a courtroom like that? I, you took it farther down a path than what would probably be successful. <laughs> okay. But if so, you're suggesting that if there's a name in, in all capital letters, first of all, you didn't write that on the page. Someone else did. And so that someone else had an intent. And that someone else was also probably an attorney. 
and so oh, you don't have any standing to say what someone else intended. And so if you were to argue that, you completely took on the burden to prove it, and they would love that. So the stance would, would be, that's not me. Well, fine, but now you got to prove it. How, hmm. do you, how do you prove somebody else's intent? It's only in their mind. And that's what a judge would say, oh, really? Let's, let's see you dig your way out of that hole. So here's another way to do this, achieve the same thing. Here's what I'm suggesting is the attorney is charging an all capital letter name. And so you ask him, what do you intend by this? Is it your intent that you're suing a live man and real party and interest? Or are you suing a fictional person? What do you mean by this? And, and now that's a completely legitimate question. And you can't understand until they answer that question. So the doubt operates against them to answer the question because they have to they have to take a stand on what their intent is. Just no one knows to ask it. And I I would guess, Tom, that you've seen paperwork in the past mm -hmm. that, that asks what a prosecutor intended by the status of a name without getting per into anything personal. Have you ever seen paperwork? Uh, something similar to that, yeah. Yeah, and the question was posed: What? Do, who do you mean by this name? Are you? Are you? Do you intend it to be a live man and real party and interest, or do you? Or is your intent to be suing a fictional person? And, uh, and so, what that? Here's what that wasn't doing: is it wasn't pointing a finger at them and saying, "This is what you intend. You're suing a fictional person." The instant you do that, you got to prove it. And now you got. And now it's now you got a controversy, and and a court has jurisdiction. Because there's a controversy. But if you've never entered the jurisdiction and you say, hey, hold it, before I step forward as, 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 uh, knowing that I'm this party, tell me, tell me who it is that you mean. And, and not only does that attorney not want to say anything, but the court doesn't have jurisdiction yet. So when mm. you, when you were first that hypothetical position that you took of, of claiming definitively with a statement that that's not you. Right. You granted jurisdiction. Right. Hmm. So as soon as they oh, yeah, answer them it, slimy, weasley little bastards. <laughs> but here's the thing: it's it's, it's sound reasoning. Right. So it's, as soon as they answer it, uh, who's they? The attorney? Yes. What is the most likely way they will answer it? Oh man, now you're asking me to speculate definitively on a hypothetical situation. But just conversationally, and if you want me to take a guess, my guess is the highest probability in that scenario would be that they would fall dead silent. You just don't hear from them. Does that sound familiar, Tom? Yeah, it does sound real familiar. Hmm. You know, for the, to the tune of, uh, what, 12 weeks now? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hypothetically, 12 weeks. <laughs> yeah, hypothetical 12 weeks. Yeah. Oh. But here's the thing is you damn well better know what you're asking and, and, and you gotta, if they do answer the question, uh, now it's hot potato and you have to, uh, there, there's certain skills in knowing where the burden of proof lies and how to stay in honor always in a burden of proof by avoiding burden of proof. I, if, I, I gotta say, this sounds more difficult than quantum physics. Oh well, no. it's, it's right up there, Ramon. There's some amazing parallels. <laughs> I think I understand quantum physics better than I do. <laughs> well, here, maybe learning it's, it, it, you're trying to understand something by jumping right in the middle of it and understanding it from just taking a, a stab at understanding one slice of it. But I think once you understand it, it's... It, it all starts to make a, a kind of a, well, it's an unpleasant really uh, knowing you start to get and you start to see. I'm, I'm starting to see the little word games that they're jumping out at me now when I see them. Uh -huh. So j just through, you know, doing this with you and the, the other, you know, little bit of research that I've done on this stuff, it's, it, it's really starting to jump out at me how words can be very slippery. Yep. Yeah. Well, I think I understand a basic concept, but it just seems that you it's like a maze, and you have to know when to turn left and when to turn right, and that's the part that absolutely confuses yep. me. Absolutely, well, Ramon. <laughs> you know, 
some of this reminds me of that. There's a scene in, in that old Harrison Ford 1980s movie where he's chasing the Ark. Oh, come on. Help me out with the name of that movie. Oh, you're Ravens talking about Lost Ark? Yeah. Remember when he was going through that a tunnel and there was there was just traps everywhere? Right, right. And the big ball rolls down after him and all that. Stuff and darts were shooting out of the side. He was dodging and weaving those things, and he had knowledge of that of those traps before the audience did. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he they didn't get him because he knew he could see all that stuff. He knew what he was looking for. And so once you once you do that, once right. once you've been through this and have been shown, th- then it's not that tough. But it's a certain common sense that grows out of it. A yeah. common sense in relation to this. Yep. Yeah, that, that's what I'm thought. That's kind of what I was trying to explain. Is what I'm starting to see is I'm starting to grow that that financial or that currency and and corporate common sense. So, okay, so it, we, we should understand. come up with a name for that. <laughs> so let's say um, let's look at it from a boxing point of view. If someone drops their left shoulder, is most likely they're going to jab. So it's okay. kind of like that. So you can anticipate that they're going to jab because they're dropping their left shoulder. Well, I'm not seeing the parallel yet. Ramon, it becomes, it's a combination of of instinctual and knowing the way, the types of games that are played. That's what I mean. That's what I mean by the boxing. Because you're reading the body movement before you see the hand move. That's what I mean. Okay. Here's something else, too, is all... Most people are not trained to think in terms of principles, fundamental principles. I'll give you an example of a right. principle is, is um, whoever brings the liability is, uh, is obliged to bring the remedy. Right. That, that's a formula that, that you can apply to see, well, who's the debtor and who's the creditor in a situation. You can even take that as, as far as a car accident to, to see why it is that if somebody smacks into your car, they owe you something. Well, whoever brings the liability has to bring the remedy. And that's something that a lot of things that people don't see when it's, let's say it comes to taxes, when someone bills you for taxes. I have not spelled out enough context for this to make sense yet, but with the IRS, whoever brings the liability has to bring the remedy. And so that's that's something else that people don't factor in when they're trying to figure out currency and, and, and the bigger, the big, the biggest picture of, of money and how it works. It's kind of funny when you do. It is actually kind of hilarious when you do. <laughs> yeah, well, learning your way through it's like, it's oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, let me, I didn't take any notes or anything. Let me think back through the uh, this corporate concept here because what I'm really trying to show is that a corporation does not exist and something that doesn't can't create something that does. Right. And so I'm just trying to remove that from when, when people are trying to figure out, well, where does money come from? You, you can take corporations, including government, off the table. You can take you can take the Federal Reserve off of it. Now, they might they might print the claim checks, the tickets to money, which is just the Federal Reserve notes. You know, they can print those up, and yeah, they're they're being created on on, on their directions and orders. Right. But it's not the corporation that made it, so you can't say that that's what made it. It always boils down to individuals. Right. So I think, uh, correct me if I if I get this wrong, a lot of the, the purpose of, of these first few segments that we've done have all been designed to really try to get some fundamental views of how you look at the system down within our consciousness. I mean, because if we can look at this stuff, and and say, look at a corporation, look at a company, look at a trust, look at a person, and see that they are, and know that they are an actual fictional person or fictional entity of some form, then that actually puts us in a completely different level of consciousness and how we deal with everything. If we can get that to a point where we know this stuff, it's not just uh, maybe uh, this sounds, you know, uh, sounds like it could be right, blah, blah, blah. It looks right on paper, but when it gets to a point where you really know that that's a fictional entity, 
yep. the way you deal with it and the way that your 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 confidence level and how you deal with it completely changes. Yeah, yeah. And you know, talk. About, you also have to understand those planes that the created can't be greater than the uh, than the creator. Right. Let's just say you wanted to sue. You, you can sue or bring lawsuits or law cases either against something on the same plane or or on a plane below in, in terms of created and creator. But you can't go up. Right. And so you absolutely have to understand that concept. If you're going to go into a court that was created and established by the government, let's not let too many wheels spin there, but just, just see that for just that narrow scope. And then try to sue something up channel, like let's say the government itself. That's one of the reasons that the United States can't be sued except for with its consent. That's somewhere in the in the statutes. Is is how do you use their courts to to sue something that that created it? Hmm. And so that's why you have to understand jurisdiction. And when you understand jurisdiction the concept of it that also helps to kind of triangulate some of these concepts too right also when you know that in a country that doesn't use gold as as a medium of, of circulation and someone were to try to sue the private central bank that private central bank is the creditor to the government so, so they're a plane higher and so you can't go and, and sue something that's superior in terms of status then the court itself, the court itself has no authority over the situation. Right. It would be like trying to sue something in a local municipal court. Like you would try to sue uh, sue the United States in a in a local a local municipal. courtroom, right? Yeah, because one is one is, is is registered and created out of the other, and you're trying to go back up channel. Right, and that's, right. And some of the reasons, some of the four ways that you can you can get jurisdiction within a federal court is that there has to be uh, diversity between the parties. I don't know if you've ever heard that, and and that's that's one of the colorable ways to say there has to it has to be someone of a different status. There has to be diversity. That's a clue that hey, look, there's a there's a status issue here that we're really going after. It's not just it's not just a physical geographical location. We got somebody from California suing somebody from Ohio. That's not what it is. I mean that 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 might be a, a vague element to it, but the real issue is is that within that catch-all phrase of of diversity, we can we can in, in, include the concept of and hide the concept of status. Hmm. And so, if if you were to try to sue a central bank, you'd have to very much be aware of of the jurisdiction of the court you're using. Hmm. I, I I don't want to have to think too much. Yeah. On yeah. No. No problem. Yeah. So so we've got corporations, companies, trust, and persons. Those are the four main categories in this uh, the fictional uh, entities that uh, we're dealing with when it comes to our currency. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Let me look up person real quick in, in Webster's and, and see what see what particular uh, entry fits the concept that we're because I know that in Webster's dictionary it's it's the most explicit I've seen as far as a generally available uh, dictionary. Here it is, and it has a lot of different entries to it, and some of them are uh, a man as opposed to things. A person as a, this is Wikipedia. A person as a being such as a human that has certain capacities or attributes constituting personhood, which in turn is defined differently by different authors in different disciplines and less formally by different cultures in different times and places. Uh, so what do you want it to mean? <laughs> well, um, I'll, drop, I'll drop the link in that I'm looking at right now. And if you, if you look at entry number six, it says character of office. And uh, in number eight, it says in law. So it's specifically when we're considering things in law, it says artificial person, an artificial person. Right. A corporation or body politic. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And so that's one of the that's one of the ways that intent is kind of hidden is is just purely within this one definition. Person has it looks to me like 
it has 11, 11 options. So, so which one, when you say person, which one of these? And you know, Ramon, you and I were speaking one time and you were saying, well, a Japanese character in terms of writing, the written, the written language, a, a single character may have many diverse meanings. And, yeah. and, and so I, I, I mostly just listened to what you had to say about the Japanese language, but the whole time I was thinking how unaware people are that, that that's the same case for, for the English language, and we're not taught that. We're not taught that any single word has a multitude of meanings, like this person right here has 11 definitions, and that's just one dictionary. And so in, whenever people use words, we're, we're trained in school for our minds to flash to a single concept assigned to that word, and that's it. Right. And we're also discouraged from um, asking questions as to the disparity of potential meanings. Well, uh, let's let's go in. Um, let me see if I can find it really quickly. But what would be the meaning of individual? Well, when who uses it? A word doesn't have meaning. Only only people can assign meaning to it. So are, let me ask you this: are, are, Is really what you're trying to say? Are you trying to say what's the definition of it? Uh, I, I, don't I guess know. so. <laughs> yeah. I don't understand your question. Well, so the definition of one of the most powerful ways that I've seen in in law is that w when they use the word individual, they are completely hoping that you'll say it, that you'll think of an individual as a noun and not a verb. Sorry, a noun and not an adjective. An individual meaning singular. Well, singular what? Right? Oh, they're saying only one, but but it still begs the question: one of of what? What status are you referring to? So it, it's that's one of the most evasive definitions I've ever seen. I've kind of chased around the definition of individual, and, and the IRS <laughs> likes to use that term a lot. Because I, I'm sure there's a lot of other people out there that, um, because person has eleven different meanings, and then you have individual. You just explain that one. So, what are you? Well, it depends on for what purpose. I mean, if you're uh, when you go to work, if if you were a radio host, you'd be you're you're, the, you're that person at that point in time. You're just sort of filling that role. Um, but you can always have the choice to say, "Hey, look, it. I don't I don't choose to." The, the term is create joinder. You don't have to create joinder all the time. I mean, once the role's over, the role's over. Hmm. Like someone who who is a, a policeman is a person. But it doesn't mean that they were born a policeman, right? When they were born, they don't say, oh, look, here's a policeman. I thought for sure we were going to have a fireman. I, I, I'm being ridiculous. It's, it's that, that character, that choice of, of who, that, that role that they fill is it, it's something that's temporary and fleeting all the time. And so the instant you're not actually acting in that capacity, you're, you're not that anymore. Right, so the, the, the proper word is obviously from, derives from the, uh, situation that you're in. And there's a, there's a certain element of knowing the correct definition of who you are in a certain situation that keeps you within your, your sovereignty. Yeah. Well, and then there's also the concept of, um, whoever feels the benefit ought to feel the burden. And so if you directly feel the benefit of, of some certain character or capacity, you also ought to feel the burden. And so that's something else, too, is uh, there's, you know, if you go to, to a restaurant and you order a meal and, and the meal is wrong and, 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 and you say, hey, listen, you, you call the wait staff over or maybe they're still there and you say, hey, this is this is a steak. I ordered a salad. If you correct, if you point out that their error right away you're not liable for the price of the steak but if you eat the whole thing and then and then say hey wait a minute this isn't right <laughs> you know for sure they're going to say tough luck you ate the thing i've seen that <laughs> yeah it, it's ridiculous it's it, it's it's talk about foolishness but it happens and so the, the raw principle behind that is whoever feels the benefit ought to feel the burden and right. so, so that's that's something else that keeps people tied into 
their their capacities uh, 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 of let's let's just say I don't know a taxpayer or something because if if, if you were deriving certain benefits un, under the under the uh, umbrella of that character's uh, position, you, you can't later say hey that's not me. You can, but uh, unless you really scrutinize the situation carefully, you could find yourself in that situation where you say, I didn't order this meal. Well, tough, like, it, but you ate the thing. Right. And, and so this can, analyzing some of these concepts can get pretty deep pretty quick. Hmm. Well, what a, like, like Ramon said earlier, what a maze. Yeah. Also, like we said earlier, once you uh, really start building that, that, uh, that, common sense savvy within this genre uh it it's all kind of i don't know it it seems like it's becoming easier to navigate and understand yeah the more you know the more you can know right so anything else we want to talk about in relation to uh corporations companies trusts and persons well i don't know i kind of i kind of just threw some concepts out there i didn't i didn't get very well through it as if it were going to be like a presentation on it. <laughs> I left a lot of stuff off the table, so if people have questions, I don't know. Well, this is this is absolutely a great place for anybody who does have questions out of what this uh, has, what we've talked about here uh, in this segment, that uh, they utilize those tools we set out there. The the uh, you know our website. You guys go ahead and email us at info at info at hundredthmonkeyradio.com. And also, there's the comment page, uh, which this show's posted under. And, and also the documents that we will be posting that goes with this show. Oh yeah, I have right. some things though for you guys to put up there, and I forgot what it, what it was that we were going to put up. Oh, the trichotomy of Roman law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you can. I'm, I'm also just going to take. I'll I'll uh, post this here in a couple of days. So uh, you got a couple of days to send me any other relevant links you think uh, we want to add to this one. So. You know, somebody asked some questions on there. I don't know if you went over and looked at that. I yeah, I did. I read through them just the other day. Uh, I don't remember exactly what they were. I'm going there right now. Maybe we'll, we can uh, bring these up on the air too. That'd be good. And I I answered those while while I was skyping with someone else, and I didn't proofread them after the fact. So I'm kind of second guessing myself a little bit right now, but. Okay, real quick, real quick, I'll go ahead and, uh, one of our listeners, Julian, asked a couple of questions here. Uh, number one, you mentioned how creditors had no risk or loss. Could you elaborate? And I think that that answer ended up like all the way at the bottom, so I, I did label it number one though. Oh, right, right. I uh, see so you stated on here, currency that originates for a commercial loan from a financial institution comes from the U.S. Treasury. It is then sent to the bank where you got your loan. The bank had no skin in the game. The currency used for the loan was not property of the bank. They essentially received their inventory for free. Now, this is uh, this is that's the basic creation of money in the system, is it not? Yeah, that's one of the methods. And, and so what I'm saying is is that the bank is just a pass through. Uh, it was just a pit stop for the money to pass through it, and, and yet, from the borrower's perspective, it would appear as if that's where the money came from because they don't see what's going on in the in, behind the scenes, behind the curtain, so to speak. Okay, another question he asks here is, uh, when an individual gets a loan, what is the property that exchange hands on both sides? And the response was, at the point in time of a loan being approved and before the currency is applied to a debt, the property in the funds is exclusively that of the borrower. He is actually the creditor. Everything in commerce is in the mirror. Then you gave a link there to a YouTube. Yep. Uh, so... Uh, this is... this this. Uh, popped trust into my mind for some reason. Now, is this drawing on the person's trust? Absolutely. Okay. And, and, you know, trust can be uh, implied. Right. And so an implied trust would, would be if, if, Tom, if you called me up and said, hey, uh, there's there's a guy that lives right by you, and, he, and he's got a check there for me for a 1000 bucks. Can you pick that up on your way over to my place? 
that's a trust and it's an implied trust and, and we didn't even see it um, be created or we didn't pay any attention to it but there's an asset there's a grantor a beneficiary and a trustee and and so whoever wrote Tom the check is the grantor and Tom you're the beneficiary and the check is the asset and I'm picking it up just for delivery I have no right to the thing I'm I'm the uh, I'm the trustee right and so uh, that that happens a lot when you go into court that if, if you know that that's a, a sheer raw principle of trust and you start to look around and say hey I wonder if there's an asset here well I wonder if there's a trustee I wonder if there's a beneficiary I wonder if there's a grantor and all of a sudden when you see those elements being filled by someone in how they act all of a sudden you can see where resulting trusts just show up and and then evaporate right and then one, once you get once you're able to identify those in a real life situation you then uh, know how to actually address each one of them for their perspective or, or respective positions yeah hmm. It, 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 like I said earlier, it's all starting to, to coalesce in my the way I'm looking at this myself. So, okay, number three. How would you make? How would someone make use of a ten of the ten commercial maxims in order to protect his claim or any other situation where they are beneficial? And the response that's was, a, "That's such a broad question. It was yeah." Tough. The only rights you have are the ones that you claim. Rights are abandoned in a flash. Every offer you get is worthy of a counter offer. Understand the maxims. Then again, there was a link to a uh, uh, belligerent claimant. Oh yeah. Thing. Did uh, you read, did you see what that judge has to say about rights? Uh, I did not read it myself. No. I don't remember. Uh... Judge James Al Albert Fee. Yeah. The pr privilege against self-incrimination is neither accorded to the passive resistant nor to the person who is ignorant of his rights, nor to the indifferent thereto. It is a fighting clause. Its benefits can be retained only by s sustained combat. <laughs> That's what I mean by offer and counteroffer. Anytime you, you get an offer, it can disappear. Wh whatever rights you just claimed a second ago can disappear. And that's what he's saying also. Mm -hmm. it, it, only by sustained combat. You, the first to leave the battlefield loses. And that goes for anything, whether it's a war, a game, or law. Right. That's uh, and, and where was that one out of? That's uh, freedomschool.com, belligerent claimant. I don't know. It's, it's, uh, I, I bet you can find that in a lot of places. But that's a, that's a quote by a judge. Okay. That, I, 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 I was thinking that had to come out of some ruling somewhere. Yeah. I think it's even a Supreme Court. Hmm. Okay, uh, number four. I understand that my labor is my property and my labor is measured using my credit. How can I gain access to more of my credit property without the nonsense of someone demanding payment as if they are creators of the property that I created? And uh, the response to that was another, uh, uh, you put a link there to the Cornell Law uh, U.S. Code. And understand this, a person lawfully holding United States coins and currency may present the coins and currency to the Secretary of the Treasury for exchange, dollar for dollar, for other United States coins and currency other than gold and silver coins that may be lawfully held. In other words, this, a person lawfully holding United States currency may present the currency to the Secretary of the Treasury for exchange. Oh, you, uh, that was just repeated. Yep. Uh, currency is an item that ca that circulates as a medium of exchange, and an item is an order to pay money. So, that I don't know if that actually. Yeah, that, that there again we have another kind of a broad and in, it takes interpretation to really understand what this guy was fishing for. Yeah. Uh, it's super deep. Yeah. And, I mean that probably take twenty minutes of conversation to really. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think he's asking is that asking for the the short route to go say can I have my money? Right. You know, and here's something else too is I I have the suspicion that Canadians can cash out their 
their birth certificate in a lump sum. I think that's how they're set up. Really? Yeah, I, I suspect that, and I don't know it for sure. But and in the way the it, the process works through the United States Treasury and and people that are set up with those accounts is that you have to, it, the system only works historically. You, it's like an insurance claimant, and so as you get bills, you can have currency created to apply to those bills. But you can't just go and say, hey, um, I, I want some cash. That It doesn't work that way. Right. So, okay, well, Julian, I want to thank you for sending those questions in. I'm, I hope we address a couple of them there in, uh, with what Spencer, how Spencer responded for you. Uh, if you have any more, feel free to drop some more in there and or, and or use the uh, info at the 100thmonkeyradio.com. And uh, like we said, we are going to be having a, Kind of a question Q&A. answer thing going on. I'm gonna tell. I'll take a look at seeing what I can figure out for something live too, Spencer. Okay. And maybe uh, set up a UStream or something like that. Uh, Google's got a new one out. That Google Play or whatever it's called. That uh, looks like a pretty decent uh, chat room area for uh, video conferencing. So uh, I may look into that. But and I'll I'll do that here in the next few days and. We'll uh, see if we can't get something set up and on the website and get some people to join us. Yeah, cool. Okay, uh, anything else you want to get out there before we uh, get out of here for this show? No, just but maybe one of these days I'll prep for this thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not a problem. It, it, I think it came off fine. And uh, if anything, uh, maybe we'll get some, uh, some flow started with our listeners in some uh, dialogue going. And uh, see if we can't, you know, get some more people's specific questions answered out there. Yeah. All righty. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us. And uh, we will be doing another one or several more of these things, I suspect. And uh, we'll keep the uh, consciousness growing on on how this currency set up here is on this planet. So, And then eventually we'll figure out how to actually uh, turn it around and work it to our own advantage. Yeah, we need to know what titles are. That'll probably be next. Okay. Just completely guess. And titles are, are something that uh, exchange with when you buy and purchase. And, and so when money goes one way, title goes the other. Hmm. And I I don't think I've even brought that up yet. No, you haven't. Yeah. Well, we'll definitely we'll get into that in the next segment. So. Okay. All right, guys. Uh, uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Spencer. Condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. The love you deny is the pain you carry. And uh, we'll see you guys later. Bye.